Are you ready? We're going back to the Song of Songs, which is really about a return to God as our king. Okay, so here we are. Let's open the curtains. We are still in Act 1, which is chapter 1, verse 2 through chapter 2, verse 7. We're going to finish this act today. We're going to find she's double-minded, trying to choose between a human king, Solomon, or does she want the Lord, who is her shepherd, as her king? And I think it's fascinating in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 through 4, it says, Shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, serve as overseers, not by force, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as lording over the flock, but be examples to the flock. So when the chief shepherd appears, who's the chief shepherd? Yeshua, the Messiah. And then it says, you'll receive the crown of glory that doesn't fade away. Now, I just want to bring up Isaiah 5. Many of you may already know that, but it's, uh, it's about how God planted a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he planted it and took the stones out and took all great care of it. And then it says, but the vineyard brought forth wild grapes. Okay, and so he says, what am I to do with my vineyard? Well, we know Israel's the vineyard. And this song is all about working the harvest, working the vineyard with Messiah. Now, if you remember last week, she compared herself. She did all the talking, all right? And she compared herself to the blackness of the tents of Kadar. What does that refer to? I went over it a little bit talking about how it was moral darkness. But <clears throat> does anyone know who Kadar was? So let's look at who Kadar was. Look at this. In Genesis 25, verse 13, these were the names of the sons of Ishmael. By their names, according to their generation, the firstborn was Ishmael, Nebahoth, and then Kedar. So we know Kedar was a son of Ishmael. Now, in the Psalms, what does the psalmist have to say about the morality of Kedar? Remember I told you the blackness refers to their morals? <clears throat> Psalm 120, verse 1 through 7. In my distress, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips, a deceitful tongue. What will be given to you, or what shall be done to you, you false tongue? Sharp arrows of the warrior with coals of the broom tree. Woe is me that I dwell in Meshach, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Kedar is people who have lying lips. Hmm, how does that sound like some of these Hamas truces? I think they've made seven truces with Gaza. Okay, and someone who hates peace. So we see Kedar, the tense of Kedar is people who are full of lying lips, deceitful tongues, and hate peace. So now I want you to understand what she is talking about. She is equating herself to the same character traits of the son of Ishmael. She has lying lips and a deceitful tongue. Okay, <clears throat> but guess what? There is hope for her, and there's even hope for Kedar. Look at Isaiah chapter 60, verse 5 through 7. Then you will see and flow together, and your heart will fear and be enlarged. Look at this. Because the abundance of the sea will be converted to you. Do you realize the sea speaks to the nations? And he's saying the abundance of, the, abundance of the nations are going to go to the belief of the Jewish people. And then it says, the forces of the Gentiles are going to come to you. The multitude of camels will cover you. The dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba will come. They shall bring gold and incense, and they will show forth the praises of the Lord. All these other nations are going to come to Jerusalem showing the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will be gathered together unto you. 
Isn't this amazing? <clears throat> okay, well, now let's take a minute. And I want to show you Ezekiel chapter 16. Some of you may wonder, what does all this have to do with the Song of Songs? I'm showing you. Now watch this. As I live, says the Lord God, he's speaking to Jerusalem. And he says, neither your sister Sodom nor her daughters have done as you and your daughters have done. Now, do you remember who are the daughters? The daughters of the surrounding communities. Okay, you have Jerusalem. One of her sisters to the north is Samaria. And one of her sisters to the south is Sodom. And all their daughters are the surrounding communities that were born out from them. And look at what he's saying. He says that Jerusalem's sin was worse than the sins of Sodom. <clears throat> he says, look. I mean, all of us, we think we have some idea of what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was. Not. That wasn't the sin. That was like the flower. It wasn't the root. It says right here. Here was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter had, what's number one? Pride. Pride. Fullness of food. Abundance of idleness. Fat and lazy. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor or needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. You know, what the thing is, they say uh, what had happened many years ago, back then, they did not like newcomers. And if any newcomer would come, they'd run them out of town. All right. And they never wanted to help the poor. They never wanted to help the needy. <clears throat> and then it says... Samaria, your other sister to the north. She didn't even commit half of your sins, but you have multiplied your abominations more than they. And then he says this, you have justified your sisters by all the abominations which you have done. So Jerusalem has done more abominations than Sodom or Samaria, which is why in the book of Revelation, it talks about Jerusalem uh, being as Sodom. But what's worse, you know what's worse about it? He says, you judge your sisters. Here you're condemning Sodom, you're condemning Samaria, and you're doing worse than they are. It says, because the sins which you committed were more abominable than theirs. They're more righteous than you. Yes, be disgraced also and bear your own shame because you justified your sisters. Wow, we all get on Sodom's case. We all get on Samaria's case. But this is the problem again about pointing the fingers and judging one another. Almost every time, even some of these preachers that are judging these other preachers are doing the very same thing. So the inhabitants of Jerusalem were haughty and self-righteous. That speaks a lot about the church. The church is always condemning the world, but there's bigger problems in the church a lot of times than there is in the world. But this is what happens in the case of all those who are self-deceived. The bad thing about being self-deceived is you don't know you're deceived. So let's look at what happens in Ezekiel 16, chapter, uh, verse 60 through 63. God says, nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you as in the days of your youth. I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you're going to remember your ways and be ashamed. Look at this. When is that going to happen? When you receive your older and your younger sisters. I am going to give you to them for daughters. But not because of my covenant with you. I'm going to establish my covenant with you and then you'll know that I am the Lord. And then you will remember and be ashamed and never open up your mouth anymore because of your own shame. When I provide you an atonement for all you have done, says the Lord God. There's a, you know, among the Orthodox Jews, they're, you know, they like to present themselves as all knowing and very righteous. And, you know, that's all great. But what happens when all, I think God is going to really bring Israel to a low point for revival's sake. 
And then what's going to happen, all of a sudden, they won't think of themselves higher and mightier than the lowly Gentile. Everyone is going to shut their mouth. You look at all the denominations in Christianity, all casting stones at one another. You know, you look at the Jews and Christians casting stones at one another. God's going to bring us all to the point where we all just shut up. <laughs> he really is. Okay. The other thing I want to bring out that you're going to see in this book, the Song of Songs, you have Jerusalem and you have the daughters of Jerusalem. Solomon doesn't love Jerusalem. Solomon loves the daughters of Jerusalem. Okay, let's watch this. Now, here is the shepherd. Last Shabbat, it was all about her talking. Finally, the shepherd gets a word in, but let me remind everybody, I forgot to announce this. We are meeting next week. It's not going to be a live stream only because I'm not in Israel. So we are going to be here next Shabbat. So all of you can watch live stream and I'll be here. Okay. Here goes the shepherd. He says to her, I have compared you, oh, my love. So when, it, when he says, oh, my love, we know it's him. What does she always say? What does she always call him? My beloved. She always says, my beloved. He always says, my love. That's how you know who's talking. And look at this right there. He says, I compare you to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, your neck with chains of gold. Now, what in the world is he talking about? You know, when you think of a horse, horses are beautiful. How many of you ever had horses? Horses, uh, they're amazing animals. As a matter of fact, why is he comparing her to a company of horses? How many of you ever heard of the Kyle woman in Proverbs 31? Listen to the book of Job. <clears throat> Have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder? Can you frighten him like a locust? His majestic snorting strikes terror. He paws in the valley. He rejoices in his strength. He gallops into the clash of arms. He mocks at fear. He is not frightened, nor does he turn back from the sword. The quiver rattles against him. The glittering spear and javelin, he devours the distance with fierceness and rage. Nor does he come to a halt because the trumpet is sounded. At the blast of the shofar, he says, aha, he smells the battle from afar, the thunder of captains and shouting. So the bridegroom sees the bride as a powerful force, unafraid of danger. Now we will hear again from the Shulamite. And she mentions that the king is sitting at his table in one room while she is in her room thinking of her beloved being with her. But before I do that, and the shepherd said, I compare you to a company of horses. And then he says, your neck with chains of gold. Take a look at this. Here's chains of gold around her neck. And we know, look at Proverbs 1 verse 9. My son, hear the instruction of your father. Don't forsake the Torah of your mother. They shall be an ornament of grace unto your head and chains about your neck. When he says her neck is graced with chains, it refers to the Torah. That's what he's saying. Are you following me? Can you see right in Proverbs? The Torah is a chain around her neck. And here in Song of Songs, he says, your neck has chains of gold. That's what she's graced with, the Torah. But the problem, many of the church think the Torah is those kinds of chain around their neck. Okay? It's like, get this thing off of me. The Torah is some horrible chain. No. It's a graceful, beautiful necklace is how the Torah is supposed to look like. Okay. So now we come to the daughters of Jerusalem. Okay, so I got a picture of the daughters of Jerusalem, and they're the ones talking now. 
first, if you remember, they were mocking the Shulamite bride when she says, where can I find you at lunchtime? Where do you feed your flocks at noon? Remember? But what happens, the shepherd comes in between the two of them and he praises the bride. So now the daughters of Jerusalem kind of go, oh, okay, we better be nice. And so they say, oh, and we'll make borders of gold with studs of silver. Okay, so now they're being nice. Now, before I go into this next part, I want to talk about something. This will, this will really help you. How many of you know smells bring back memories? Big time. Big time. For example, I was talking to a military man who was, during the war, he was serving in Kuwait. And he would go to the cafeteria. And he said there was a smell that would always comfort him and bring him back home. And it was at breakfast when they had Fruit Loops. Every time he would smell Fruit Loops, it would bring him memories of home. And now that he's home, every time he smells Fruit Loops, he thinks of being in Kuwait. You know how the, the smell works with the memory. How many of you remember the smell of freshly cooked bread coming out of the oven? Do you recognize that smell? How about the smell of a new baby? coming fresh out of the oven. <clears throat> well, how about the poor father? Remember the smell of the stinky diaper they have to change. He'll never forget that smell. Oh, and you can smell fresh wine and cheese can bring back memories or chocolate. Okay. But, but smells can take you back decades and remind you of something. This is why God had all the spices in the temple, in the anointing oil, in the incense, so that we would remember home. The temple is to be home. And think about that. All of the spices were to bring back the smells of home. That, I mean, why else would God do that? He knows our smell is... Looking at something can bring back a memory, but smelling it can bring back more memory. I mean, looking at a box of Fruit Loops may bring back memories, but you smelling the Fruit Loops, it's really going to bring back the memory. So God had the whole entire temple system set up for us to remember the memory of fellowship with him. Okay. For example, every Havdalah, what do you do? At Havdalah, you light the candle, you have some wine, and then you have incense, and everyone smells it. Every Saturday night at the end, they pass this thing around and to smell. And again, it's to bring back memories. Now, look at Exodus 30, 7 through 9. It says, Aaron shall burn thereon sweet incense. Every morning when he dresses the lamps and will burn incense on it. And when Aaron lights the lamp said, even he will burn incense on it. A perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generation. You shall not offer what? No strange incense. Remember Nadab and Abihu. <laughs> they offered strange fire with strange incense. Okay. But it's to be every morning and every night. God wanted this incense burning. And then he says, look at Exodus 30, 23 through 25. The Lord tells Moses, I want you to take the best of the spices, 500 shekels weight of liquid myrrh. Here's some myrrh with some liquid myrrh here. And he said, I want a whole bunch of it, 500 shekels weight. And let's throw in some sweet cinnamon. Okay. And, and he says, you know, half as much as that. 150 shekels, and then 250 shekels of sweet calamus and of cassia, 500 shekels, weight measured by the scale of the holy place, and of olive oil, a hen. Make these into a holy oil, a perfume made by the art of the perfume maker. It is to be holy oil. Okay, so I want you to understand uh, how the spices the whole concept, even in the temple or the tabernacle, 
was to bring the smell of sweet incense. Now, look at Song of Songs, chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Oh, before I go there, I want to show you some more things. I got to tell you this. Okay, here is the temple. And I don't know if you knew it, but like a farm, they have a little farmhouse in the temple itself. There was a place where they would have the cattle pen and the sheep pens, and they would, you know, always have to check them to make sure they were without blemish one more time when they went to have them be offered. Now, you have to think about this. It's a slaughterhouse, okay? When you're slaughtering meat, what do you have? Flies. I'm telling you, do you have flies? And they don't have refrigeration, and they're hanging out in the sun in front of the temple, okay? So if you'll notice in this picture, over here is the altar. There's the big laver. And here's where they would slaughter all the animals. They'd be chained up here and hung up and like you would hang up a chicken or whatever else. And they would slaughter them right there uh, in the holy place or in the outer courtyard. And then they would take, they'd, blood be going everywhere, which is why they had the laver. Got to wash our hands. But all the animals would be hanging there. Can you imagine, is outside how many flies are going to be all around it? But God knows what he's doing. The formula of the incense kept all the flies away. They say not one time was there ever a fly. Not one time. It's because the incense not only would bring memories of the past, but the formula kept all insects away. I mean, that's insane. It's outside. It's in a desert. It's hot. You've got raw meat hanging there. Not one fly because of the spices. Only God. <laughs> well, here, I'll tell you what. Well, they said the holy oil, no one could make it or they're dead. This has, now, you could get your own special, different formula a little bit. But here, how many of you know, sometimes people will put a sachet of different incense and they'd put it in their dresser drawers or in a chest. Uh, I remember my mom, we had a cedar chest and she'd always put something inside of it. To, I forgot what it was. <clears throat> yeah, mothballs and different things. Ooh, that smell. <clears throat> but sometimes back in the day, what ladies would do, they would get a sachet of incense with a string and they would wear it around their neck. And so the sachet bag, everywhere they went, they would smell good. They would wear it around their neck. All right. Okay. Now I'm laying the foundation here. So look at let me see. Okay, so back to the Song of Songs 1, 12 through 14. And I think this is fascinating. She says, while the king was on his couch. Okay, here's Solomon. He's over on his couch. <laughs> woo -hoo! And she says, while the king was over on his couch, my beloved, and she's not referring to the king because he's over on his couch. And she says, my beloved is to me a sachet of myrrh that lies between my breasts. My beloved to me is as a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of En Gedi. And so what do we see here? There's a, a spike nard or a, the nard. And what does she say? It's like myrrh and henna in the vineyards of En Gedi. And she is remembering, all of a sudden, she's in the king's castle, if you remember. And she's calling out to the shepherd. Now, she has this incense around her, and she is remembering back to when God was their king rather than a human king. You following me? Okay, the, uh, what's happening is the spices around her are evoking memories of her first marriage. Look what it says in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 2. It says, go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your spousals, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land that wasn't sown. That was Sinai. That was Shavuot. That's when the espousal took place, when God gave them their commandments. God 
and was engaged to Israel. So this is God also remembering when Israel was basically married to him. She's now forsaken him and she's gone to a human king that upset him. And now he's trying to draw her back to himself. Oh, here it is. Isaiah 5, 1 and 2. Now will I sing to my well-beloved, this is the bride, a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved has a vineyard in a very fruitful here hill. He fenced it. He gathered out the stones. He planted it with the choice vine. He built the tower in the midst. That's a tower to watch for the enemy coming, like foxes and the like. And he also made a wine press, and he looked at it, it would bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. You ought to read the rest of the story in Isaiah 5. I don't have time to go over it, but I want to bring out the point that in the verse where she has the incense, it's evoking memory going back to God as her king. And now this is showing you that. And now watch what happens. Now the shepherd is speaking and look what he says to her. You are beautiful, my love. This is how you know he's talking. Behold, you are beautiful. Your eyes are as what? Doves. And when we think of a dove, we think of something, we think of the Holy Spirit, okay? You think of something calm and peaceful. Notice he didn't say, your eyes are like the eyes of a hawk. Okay, what's the difference? A hawk is unclean because it's a predator. A dove is clean because it's not a predator. All right? Now, where is he looking? At her eyes. Every woman wants the guy to look in her eyes. Okay? But where is she looking? She goes, hey, yeah, you're beautiful, my beloved, truly delightful. But look, our bed is green. The beams of our house are cedar. Our rafters are of fur. She's not consumed with him looking in his eyes. She's looking at all the blessings she get by going into this marriage. I'm sc look, score me. Look what I get. I'm going to marry him. It's our rafters. I mean, he's looking in her eyes, trying to, while she's going like this. Wow, look at that. Look at that. Score. So her heart isn't with the shepherd yet. That's my point. This whole story in the Song of Songs is the maturity of the bride. He's always been consumed with her. She's always been consumed with what she gets out of the relationship. Okay, now the Shulamite continues. And this is where there's wrong translations in the King James. I'll go over it later, but this is the Old Testament that Danny, I'll be working on this next year. <clears throat> in the King James, it says, I am the Rose of Sharon, which is wrong. It's I am a Rose of Sharon, a Lily of the Valleys. So here she's saying, look, I'm one of these roses among all the roses. I am one of these lilies among all the lilies. Okay, the Rose of Sharon is the Messiah. Okay, a Rose of Sharon is part of the flock. Now, <clears throat> let me show you, and I will prove that. Look at Hosea chapter 14. It says, O Israel, return to the Lord your God. And that's what the shepherd's trying to get her to do in this story. You have stumbled because of your iniquity. I will heal your backsliding. I will love them freely for my anger has turned away. I will be like the dew to Israel. He shall grow like the lily. Well, guess what? Israel is compared to lilies. That's what I wanted you to see. And when it says the do, it is referring to the resurrection of the dead. And I will prove that to you here with the scriptures in just a little bit. So basically what he's saying, I'm the one who's going to raise Israel from the dead and he's going to grow like the lily. Now, look at what he says in the next verse. He says, as the lily is among thorns, so is my love among the daughter's so here's the daughters of Jerusalem and the shepherd compares them to thorns, 
but Jerusalem as a lily among the thorns. So the shepherd doesn't care about the daughters of Jerusalem. He cares about Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, uh, when she was born, when Jerusalem first came into existence, of course, it wasn't Jerusalem. She was surrounded by Canaanite nations. Now look at Psalm 137, verse 5 and 6. It says, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. If I don't remember you, let my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. If I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. So the shepherd loves Jerusalem. Solomon loves the daughters of Jerusalem. Okay, so now we find she is talking about him. And she says about him as an apple tree among the trees of the forest. So is my beloved among the young men. With great delight, I sat under his shadow and his fruit was sweet to my taste. Well, look at Psalm 91, 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who trusts in him. Psalm 109, uh, 119, 103. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. So he is the apple tree and he bears fruit and were to bear fruit. If you remember uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 he talks about the fruit of the spirit. But look at Hosea 14, 8 and 9. Ephraim's going to say, what have I to do anymore with idols? They're beginning to repent. And it says, I have heard and observed him. I am like a green cypress, cypress tree. And then God tells Israel, your fruit is found where? In me. That's where the fruit is. Let them understand these things. Who is prudent? Let them know them. The ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but the transgressors stumble in them. Isn't that amazing? The very path that the righteous walk, the wicked stumble over. It's the same path. And the same thing with the law. People stumble over the law and others walk in the law. The problem isn't the law. The problem is your walk. Okay, so now the Shulamite continues and look what she says. He brought me to the banqueting house. His banner over me was love. And then she says, sustain me with flagons. Comfort me with apples. I am sick of love. Okay, well, guess what? She just said the shepherd brought me to his banqueting house, which means she's now left Solomon. She's not with the king. She's now with the shepherd. Okay, so here's the, a flagon of wine. The problem is she drinks too much. Look at Hosea 3, 1 through 5. Then said the Lord to me, remember he's telling Hosea to go marry a harlot. And Jerusalem was considered a harlot. And look what this says. Go love a woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods. And what else did they do? They love the flagons of wine. That's their problem. So watch this. Hosea says, I bought her. His wife. He buys her for 15 pieces of silver. An omer barley, a half omer barley. And I said unto her, you're going to live with me for many days and you're not going to play the harlot. And you will not be for anyone else. And so I will not be for anyone else either. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, a prince, without a sacrifice, without an image, an ephod, teraphim. That's what happened in the last 2,000 years, guys. This prophecy was fulfilled for the last 2,000 years. This is talking about today. And then it says, afterward, the children of Israel are going to repent or return and they're going to seek the Lord their God, David their king, and they're going to fear the Lord and his goodness in the last days. Here it is. This is exactly talking about where we're at right now and about the song. The Song of Songs is a prophecy about today. 
and they're going to return back to God as their shepherd and as their king. They're not going to want a human king. Look at the problems they have right now with a human king, so to speak. But do you know what's amazing about this? How much did he buy her for? Fifteen shekels. Okay, here you have a, a big ox. Listen to Exodus 21, 32. If an ox gores a slave, a male or female slave, he has to give to their master 30 shekels of silver and the ox will be stoned. So what we see here, a slave was worth 30 shekels, but the bride was only worth 15 shekels. That shows you how much her value had dropped. Okay. Now, here's the next most important verse. And the reason is it's a wrong translation in the King James again. In chapter 2, verse 6, it says, His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. Who's speaking? She is, because she says, His left hand is under my head, and his right hand embraces me. So who's laying down? Okay, let me help you. His left hand is under my head and his right hand is embracing me. She is the one that is laying down. Then, as a matter of fact, listen to Psalm 121, 4. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. How many of you know God is the shepherd, the chief shepherd, he never slumbers or sleep. So it can't be him sleeping. And look at the next verse, Song of Songs, chapter 2, verse 7. He says, I have adjured you, daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, stir not up nor awake love, my love, until she please. And every English King James Bible, it says he please, as if he's the one sleeping. It's not he please, it's she please. Now, the Young's literal translation has it right. So some translations do say she, but King James is wrong, and it says he so who is going to sleep? The bride, the church. That's who constantly falls asleep all throughout history. Today, the sleeping church is known as the woke church. Just like Balaam who claims, I see the one who sees. And he didn't see the angel, but the dumb donkey did. Now, Here's the problem with wokeness. Here you have people that are pro Hamas and Hamas will kill them in a heartbeat. These people like them promoting Hamas is like chickens promoting Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. But the problem like I said, is the bride is fast asleep and she wants to sleep a little longer. So that ends the service. And then next week, we're going to begin chapter two, where the shepherd calls her and she falls asleep again. Let's dance. <laughs>